Good evening, Julian. Good evening, Mike. And good evening to everybody listening and watching. And welcome to the next episode of Veterinary Ramblings. I, I, hey, we've just we just had a text. I've just had a text uh, from yeah. Wolfgang. You do realise you do realise you've given it away. I, I know. I know. We might have to just cut that little bit. Yeah. Well, we're we'll not. Or not, because actually, you know, we're always professional. People know that. People have known that, that for, for all the four se- seasons they've been watching us, yeah. we've been incredibly professional. Absolutely. And they know that I wouldn't have given away the first name without the expectation that people wouldn't know the surname. Because it's not Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart we're speaking to. <laughs> so I'm thinking, which Wolfgang is it? I know a few. That'd be absolutely miraculous, wouldn't it? It'd be great, wouldn't it? Yeah, wouldn't that be cool? And you know, he was such a, a polymath that um, even though he wasn't formally trained as a vet, by the age of 13, he probably could have cracked it. He, he probably could. And he could have written a sonata to uh, illustrate the fact. Yeah, like Frank. Like Frank. Who? Frank Sonata, yeah. Oh, Frank Sonata, yeah. yeah. Hi. I'm Mike Brampton. And my name is Julian Hope. Welcome to Veterinary Ramblings. Tell tell us more about Wolfgang and then I'll let him in. So so Wolfgang's a vet and he was one of the first vets I was on BSAVA Regional Committee with back in 1996, just after I qualified. So I've known him for uh, for, for that that amount of time. He was the founder and owner of Virginia Water Veterinary Clinic. and he sold to a veterinary corporate uh, two years ago and immediately went off to work in Sweden and right. other islands. Uh, and and he's, he's now planning to work pretty much all over Europe. Excellent. So I think we're going to hear his tale of, of being a, a wandering or itinerant veterinary surgeon. The peregrinations of Wolfgang, we should call this. The peregrinations? What? Pere- peregrinations. The, per- the peregrinations of Wolfgang. Absolutely, because of course, you know, the peregrine falcon is so named because it wanders so far. Right. From the Greek peregrinas, meaning to wander. That's fantastic. Well, he's and in the waiting are... room. Shall we let him in? Let's get him in. Let's, Let's get, get him, in. him in. Hi, Mike. Hi, Julian. Uh, anyway, Wolfgang, look, we, we're so pleased to have you on the show. Yes, Thank welcome. you so much. You, you can call yourself very lucky that I'm with you because I actually turned down Fiona Bruce. I had a, I had a date with Fiona Bruce tonight and wow. because I was called, I, I had agreed to see you, I turned her down. Well, do you know, um, Fiona is much prettier than both of us. It's, but, it's not uh, completely a lie. It's actually so that they are um, question time by the BBC is tonight in Windsor. And they were looking for people for the audience. It's an online audience. So in the hmm. same way as it is right now. And so I applied for it. And I indeed got a telephone from the, from the call from them. And on Monday or Tuesday, if I would have time on Thursday evening to be part of the audience. And you had to say, I'm ever so sorry, BBC, but I've got a prior engagement with veterinary ramblings. Exactly. That's what I did. There you go. The slight problem was also a slight problem, admittedly, was also that I had to work until seven o'clock and they would have needed me until starting at quarter past six or something like that. So tell me, Julian was saying in the introduction there, Wolfgang, that um, you have you have fled our fair shores. Um, nothing to do with Brexit, I hope. I'm still here. I'm still here. I'm at the moment in Surrey. Despite sort of COVID or bear, sort of taking, sort of uh, hampered a little bit by the COVID restrictions, I'm sort of driving forward and backwards between Bavaria and, uh, and Surrey. That's okay. True. Well, mm-hmm. Ju- Julian mentioned that you've been working in Sweden as well. That's correct, yeah. That was I in January, February. I went for a tour to Sweden, and then in the summer I was there again. Mm-hmm. Wow! So there's a colleague of us who who is organizing these sort of trips to Sweden, and and I wrote to him here. If you are into it, if there's an opportunity or if there's a possibility for me to work, then send me as far north as you like, as long as there's snow, because I like cross country skiing. I was in Falun, and I was also mm-hmm. In February of uh, this year, I was in a place called Kumla, 
Did you get any skiing done? Yeah. That, I mean, that, that was the irritating thing. I, I arrived sort of New Year's Eve uh, in Sweden. I drove the whole way up because I had all my skiing equipment with me and they virtually didn't have any snow. And then the Swedes said, yeah, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. And there was the first week in January, the next week in January. And I looked at the weather forecast and yes, yeah, cold, sometimes minus mm -hmm. 10 or so, but no clouds, blue sky, um, no snow. It was, and the, the Swedes said that they never had winter like that. And they showed me pictures sort of of the previous year where they had horses on the field and they were sort of to the belly in, in the snow. And they said, well, we're so sorry. But um, so I had to drive in two hours to, to a mountainous area um, to, uh, to have a little bit of cross-country skiing. And at the National Ski Stadium, they had a World Cup cross-country skiing race. It was all just artificial snow. So it was disappointing. In that respect, it was very disappointing. Yeah. So this, this is wintertime close to the Arctic Circle. Not, not, not. There's still a few hundred kilometers to the Arctic Circle, but certainly further north than, than London, yes. Closer than Virginia water. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Skiing in so deep snow is, I find it bloody difficult. Admittedly, I, I come down pretty much all the hills I have to come down, but my <laughs> technique is actually not, is, 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 I think, not that great. And it shows if the conditions get difficult, that that separates the boys from the men. And I'm afraid I'm, I'm not there, but, but I'm working on it. We don't, we don't, in this country, get enough, um, enough snow to be able to practice powder like that, do we? No, not really. To, to be able to go down a field like that and leaning back, especially with those wonderful uh, carver skis on, just pushing the... Well, that, now that's the, that's the difference here, Julian, the significant difference between the type of skiing that Wolfgang does, please interrupt yeah. me if I get any of this wrong, Wolfgang, is that um, you, Julian, are used to having your heels clamped onto the skis. The skiing that Wolfgang's doing here is sometimes known as heel-free. And the, the reason it's called heel-free skiing or telemark skiing is because the heel can lift up off the ski itself. I'm just going to quickly share, share my screen with you and show you a, a different, um, different video here, which gives you an idea. You can see how the heel is lifting up off the back it of the ski there. Look at that. It's incredibly elegant, isn't it? Isn't that beautiful? And, and some of them are crossover skis now, aren't they? You can, uh, you can clip the heels back on properly. And, uh... I think there's on one hand the cross-country skis that have obviously also a free heel, and they are just sort of uh, a pair of skis that are only that thick, and you, 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 you go in special tracks. So mm. the skiing you just so um, uh, that's really difficult with cross country. So you can do it as well, but then you really have to have very good balance because these skis they don't have a steel edge. Yeah. Then uh, to go more alpine, you can do the telemark skiing. That means, uh, as Mike explained, you have a you have a free heel, but you have skis with uh, with steel edges. And then the next step is the ski mountaineering. Um, uh, that is also um, a combination. You have a free heel so that you can walk longer distances, and you often, if you walk uphill, you have you have skins underneath your skis, uh, so that you have grip and you can, I mean, go really steep hills up with them. And when you are up on top of the hill, there's a uh, you can then fix your heels so that you have something that is similar to an alpine ski where the boot is solidly glued to the ski. And then you obviously have the alpine skis, and then rather than sort of having two individual skis, you can have a mono ski. And then the mono ski is sort of straight down. And then obviously you have the snowboard where you, where you stand sideways on the board, but also both legs fixed to the board. So yeah. that is pretty much the whole range of skiing devices. See, I, I, I do ski mountaineering, but, but I, I take my skis off, put them 
on, on my backpack and walk yeah. up with them. Much more sensible. Yeah, mm-hmm. I've seen a photograph of you walking down like that as well, haven't you? <laughs> uh, yeah, a couple of times. Yeah, yeah. You, you <laughs> can get down a lot quicker if you put them on your feet. I, uh, I had to ski down on one ski a couple of years back. I was in uh, I was in Flen in France, and while I was having uh, a, a light lunch, I think it could have been a bottle of uh, bottle of claret and a steak, uh, someone tried to steal my skis, and they they got so far as to undo the um, the bindings of one of my skis, and then they must have been interrupted. So I went outside, got my skis on, skied off and my left ski remained behind <laughs> my, yeah. my foot was in the bindings and it wasn't attached to the ski so i had to actually ski down holding a ski using it as a as an additional level of support did do you know what you can do is to avoid that people are skiing uh, stealing your skis put them individually in two different places okay you might be super unlucky that the idiot who wants to steal your ski, uh, ski, uh, steal your ski, sort of will watch you where you put the individual one. These are usually opportunists, and they are not looking around. So I find that it's usually the safest way. I, I think, think you're right. I think the other the other way that Julian probably avoid his skis being taken is if he actually paid the rental for them, so that the <laughs> ski shop didn't have to so- go up the hill to actually reclaim the skis. <laughs> When he hadn't paid the rent, so no, see, what what I what I did a few years back was was the ultimate. I um I bought my my first set of skis a few years back, and the, the, they were the ones that someone tried to steal. But then, a couple of years ago, uh, I decided to buy the ugliest skis in the world, and no one would ever want to to nick them. They're called Scott Crusaders. Now other other makes of ski are available. Uh, Scott do some really good skis. And these are really good skis. They're fantastic skis, but man, they are ugly. They really are. <laughs> mm. Awful. Yeah, well, if, if, if they're not colour coordinated, then... Uh, well, as I am tonight, of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. One of your, your colourful scrub tops, I see that, it, yes. Uh, yeah. it's, a, it's a homemade one. It's one. You're blending. You're blending nicely in with the vegetation around you. I, I try to do. I, I sit down of an evening and hope that my wife doesn't notice I'm here, and, and uh, uh, ask me to help with the washing up and things. You've got. I've it's, just. Look, I've just looked up Scott Crusade skis. You've got no taste. Yeah. They're gorgeous. Anybody, See, I like. I like. Them. Everyone else thinks Ugh, they're awful. Tell me. I want to. I want to know more about Sweden, Wolfgang, and, and working as a vet in Sweden. Working as a vet in Sweden to start mm-hmm. with. Sort of in in Sweden um, at the moment they. They have a they have an acute shortage of vets. So that that got me also sort of up there. In my case, it's so um, I speak Norwegian, so uh, then Swedish is not so far away from from Norwegian. So that certainly helps. So especially when it comes to reading clinical notes, so, so that's that's quite quite helpful. Mm-hmm. There's also so I have a. Norwegian authorization. So that one is also recognized in Sweden. So right. I can theoretically work in Norway or I can be- work based in, on that in Sweden. Did you have to get another qualification for that? Or was that. Uh... No, normally, normally not. If you are an MRCBS, you could theoretically also go up there. But obviously, there is the, uh, the language barrier with the uh, clients. Admittedly, sort of the. Um, the team uh, uh, in the veterinary hospitals, pretty much everybody speaks English perfectly. So it's very, very good. But then mm-hmm. if you have clients, elderly, sweet, so they might struggle with English. And then you, you have to take somebody out to translate. But I mean, that is not much dissimilar from working in Hong Kong or Singapore or so, mm-hmm. where, where you might have to consult with uh, uh, somebody who is translating. Mm-hmm. The majority of the work is similar. Obviously, they there are certain things, certain procedures they don't do routinely. For example, neutering is uncommon um, as a preventative procedure. So because of that, you see far more um, pyometras. You have far more operations because of uh, mammary tumors. That makes a difference. And uh, another big difference is also 
Swedish, but also Norwegian vets don't have a right to dispense medication. So um, what you can do is you can give injections, uh, but then if uh, people need any creams or tablets or something like that, they usually have to get it from the local pharmacy. What's the definition mm-hmm. of local? Because you were telling me the other day that the people drive stupid amounts of, uh, yeah. of miles to, to get to the vets in the first place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sort of, I, I always ask sort of clients before I started with the consultation or check with the nurse how far they were coming. And uh, very worrying if a, if a Swedish client says, I am living 15 miles away from here. So that is a problem. Because the Swedish mile is not one and a half kilometers, it's 10 kilometers. So this pet owner has driven 150 kilometers one way, and we are not talking motorway. It's possibly part of it might be a gravel pass, and then uh, it's a countryside uh, road, but with three villages, villages, where you are only allowed to drive 50 kilometers per hour or so. Uh, with regular speed checks, so they probably have traveled two and a half to three hours to get to the practice just one way. Mm-hmm. So that's not uncommon. That's not uncommon, and they are traveling much longer distances. Mm-hmm. Bugger if they get home and the bandage has fallen off, isn't it? <laughs> it's also so that waiting for uh, for Swedish clients completely different from from British clients. I I sort of remember so my nurses were already getting a little bit edgy when somebody was sort of waiting longer than 15 minutes mm. uh, here in yeah. the UK. And I mean, I had people in Sweden, they were happily waiting four hours for a cat with a, a female cat with a cystitis to be seen. You go to them and you say, I'm so sorry that you have to wait so long. And I'm, I'm terribly sorry, but we had two other emergencies and had to operate in between. So, so, no, 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 it's not a problem. So, we had it lovely here. We brought our chairs and we had a picnic and, and then it started raining and we were sitting in the car listening to the radio. It was lovely. And, okay. <laughs> okay. <That's incredible. laughs> okay. So, so presumably you don't have 15 minute cons- consults out there. You don't. Yeah, people. But, well, no. Yeah, no, 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 depending on what it is. I mean, the, the, the clinics I work in, there, they are usually referral clinics and then they um, uh, uh, do a fair amount of um, accident and emergency. So clients can also go to their local sort of uh, vet, but these are usually general practitioners. So they predominantly see farming animals and then mm. vaccinate the old dog and... Uh, might do some minor procedures, but as soon as there's anything that might need hospitalization or might need any imaging or something like that, then they say, no, 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 you go off to the veterinary. Also, (laughs) with dogs, um, especially with dogs, I would say 80 to 90 percent of the dogs that I saw over there are insured, far more than in the UK. And also the cats are definitely more than 50% of the cats are insured. Oh, really? So, yeah, so you can do a more thorough workup on them? Not necessarily. I, I didn't find the Swedish clinics, what shall I say, sort of very commercially driven also. It was more so, okay, you, you, you do what is necessary, but yeah, I don't know. It, it, it just requires... Uh, uh, an injection and some tablets and do that and don't go over the top with with workup i i was at times sort of would say nearly held back because they said no i don't think that people would like to have it too far investigated and they were also i my impression was with the swedish pet owners they are possibly i mean okay it might be different in stockholm also but if you are more on the countryside they are more down to us. Sort of, if you say, "Well, uh, yes, we can do this or that or that," and but um, the prognosis is not good. They was quite often so that they quite, although the animal was insured and everything would have been paid for, they would have mm-hmm. said, "No, no, don't want to do that. We'd rather put the dog down while the dog is still okay." Mm -hmm. and not okay but but it's okay poor prognosis not suffering yet so rather a little bit earlier 
in comparison with my British client than uh, than later. Interesting. And and getting back to the the no neutering uh, mm. aspect of it, uh, I, I read recently that um, pine metro, as you, as you said, is quite common. Uh, it's about twenty five percent of of bitches uh, over the age of eight will, will have a pine metro on there. What about um, male dog behaviour? Because I heard that, that again, there's, there's a lot more aggression and, and attacks on people from, from uh, dogs per capita out there. I, 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 I can't relate to that at all. I don't know. I saw a lot of unneutered dogs, uh, male dogs up there. I had my own dog in the summer. I had my own dog with me. I virtually never had any issues with any local dogs in, in Sweden and I found generally sort of that uh, uh, pet owners in Sweden, they have good control over their dogs and the dogs seem to be pretty, what shall I say, well socialized. Mm -hmm. I cannot say the same thing about sort of, I traveled then also with my dog further south, sort of south of of Bavaria and then Austria and then going further down to Italy. And I had far more problems down there. In Germany and in Austria, often because uh, people are notoriously holding their dogs on the lead Mm -hmm. and also in inappropriate situations, in my opinion, inappropriate situations when dogs want and try to interact with each other and then they are held back. And because of that, they never get a chance to properly interact with other dogs. Mm -hmm. And after a while, sort of, they obviously... They get scared if 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 a, if a dog comes towards them, and if you then go further down, sort of when, when I was this this summer in Tuscany and in Apulia, there the issue is that they have a lot of straying dogs, not stray dogs, but but dogs that have a home, but owner just lets them out and uh, they then protect the property. They're on the property, they're on the road and uh, they consider everything within 50 meters or 100 meters of the house as their pet. Mm -hmm. And then they have their local sort of arrangements with the other dogs in the village. So everybody knows who is top dog. But if you barge in there with your not uh, established dog, it's... (laughs) It's tiring. You have to fend off all the time the dogs that want to kill your dog. So it's uh, wow. uh, or, or want to chase your dog off. It's uh, it, it's it's difficult. Mm-hmm. So the mafia yeah. the mafia is alive and well and living in Italy. <laughs> oh, well. So t- tell us a bit about your your work with Fakava. Uh, t- tell the, the 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 listeners and viewers first of all what what Fakava is. Yeah, that is I. <laughs> I walked around some some years ago, what is it, five, six years ago. I thought, let's give that a try. And I actually showed that to my European colleagues. I went around on PSAVA Congress and I sort of, I filmed that and and asked colleagues, what does FECAVA stand for? And they were sort of, FECAVA, FECAVA, feline, canine, Europe. No. No idea, no clue. And it just, I mean, I, I then sort of showed that to my European colleagues and I said, here, this is, the the brand awareness is zero. <laughs> it's absolutely zero. Or it's, it's actually not great. Mm-hmm. So in the UK, well, it has to do with the fact, that it just shows what a brilliant job BSAVA is doing. Because, I mean, you get a lot of you get a lot of CPD homegrown um, by BSABA, and uh, so because of that, you're not so much dependent on the offerings in uh, in Europe. But uh, in other European countries, FICAVA is a very very well known organization. So FICAVA stands for the Federation of European Companion Animal Veterinary Associations. We have. Uh, 40 national uh, member organizations. They reach from the UK or Ireland, actually in the West, until Armenia and Georgia in the East, and then in the North from uh, Norway down to Spain and Portugal or to Cyprus. It's a 
what shall I say, an umbrella organization for uh, all these national organizations. And we are sharing knowledge. We are exchanging CPD. We have an annual congress uh, conference on matters like animal welfare, stray dogs. We, we try to work together to have a pan-European approach. We have through UEVP, which is the organization of practicing veterinarians in Europe, and the FE, the Federation of Veterinarians in Europe, um, a direct link to the uh, European Commission and the European Parliament to try to highlight uh, small animal specific uh, issues in, in Europe. And then we are also partnering with WSAVA, so this World Small Animal Veterinary Association, in some uh, projects, one of which is every three years a joint congress, which normally would have been this year in September in Warsaw, but uh, COVID had different ideas. <laughs> yeah. So, so which, which you get, so is, is Brexit going to change any of this then? Or, 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 or are vet associations just ignoring the, the whole uh, elephant in the room, so to speak. When it comes to European veterinary, um, small animal veterinary association, it doesn't play much of a role because we have uh, small animal veterinary associations as members who are within the EU and who are outside of the EU. I mean, right. say the Serbian small animal veterinary association, Serbia is not in the EU, Armenia, Georgia is not in the EU. So with the UK not being uh, uh, in the EU. So that doesn't make much of a difference. So it's more of a geographical European group rather than a political European Yeah, group. correct. That's correct. The majority of legislation of importance is then done in Brussels or with EU members. Mm -hmm. And it's very often so that uh, the countries that are not part of the club, they still try to align the rules and regulations with the EU. To give you an example, for example, Switzerland, not an EU member, they still have a pet passport which looks very similar to the uh, EU pet passports and uh, is also uh, recognized in the same way. So actually, li listeners uh, and, and viewers, uh, I should remind you, if you do want to take your, your, your pets abroad, uh, then you will now need a new pets passport. So the old pets passport uh, will, will not be valid. Uh, please seek advice from your uh, veterinary surgery as to how to get, go about getting a new pets passport. You, you'll almost certainly need to repeat rabies vaccination unless you've had that done uh, with a, uh, a rabies uh, blood teeter test. So do, do, do contact your, your, your vets about that. Uh, so there's a, there's a new, well, there, but that's also, so that's a little bit news to me. So there's a new format, yeah? Well, it's, it's the old, old format. So before the Sengen uh, Treaty, I pronounced that wrong, haven't I? Uh, uh, Schengen. 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 Thank you. It didn't, didn't sound right to me. But, but, but before that, uh, obviously, the, the, the idea was we would get uh, a blood test having vaccinated the pets, a blood test to say that they were showing antibodies to, uh, to, to rabies. Um, now, that was, that was scrapped uh, by and large. Uh, you could get a, a vaccination and uh, reliably uh, know that they were vaccinated and therefore protected against rabies uh, because of the Schengen Treaty. Uh, with us leaving Europe, there is no longer that dispensation. And so we need to go back to having the, the rabies teeter test done. Uh, yet another example, I don't want to get political, but yet another example of, of how wrong Brexit is. So, but it's, that is something that is driven by the UK government, then. Um, but, it's, well, it's, or, or let's, let's put it the other way around. 
It is mm -hmm. so. If you enter the um, uh, uh, your or a pet passport uh, mm -hmm. country from a non-pet passport country, the usual requirements are uh, rabies vaccination, 30 days plus, uh, then you take a drop of blood, uh, and sufficient antibody titer, and then there's a three months wait before you can travel freely and you need to up, keep up your rabies vaccination. So that are the requirements if you come from the outside. My take on that was, uh, uh, on that was that providing we end up with a Brexit deal, it will remain so that the blood test will not be required. But without a deal, then the UK would be considered a third country, and then obviously they need to meet these requirements. So that is my that, that's, that's right. That's right. The, um, the, the 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 general understanding at the moment is that there won't be a uh, uh, an agreement, um, and it seems unlikely that the agreement will be in place in time for people to uh, to, to, to rely on getting a pet's passport without a blood test. So, who who knows is the example is the answer. Uh, Boris now has lost uh, all his advisors and is winging it. Uh, I think his uh, his wife is well versed in um, everything political, and so she'll be able to tell him just what to do. But clearly, he, he poor chap can't make decisions by himself. So we'll we'll just have to wait and see. And, As there, I said, and, there, we, and there we go. I thought I would talk. Politics with Fiona Bruce tonight, and there we go. I'm talking politics with you guys. Oh. Yeah. Well, actually, should we hear from Boris Johnson now, please? Boris, <laughs> can you give us a steer on the uh, the rabies situation? Yes, yeah, it's quite it's quite simple, really. I, I've been through this many times. I'll go through it again once more. It's very very simple. So, if you want to take your dog abroad, then you can certainly take it abroad. Please feel free to take it abroad uh, unless you can avoid doing so but if you can <coughs> take it abroad with a blood sample then do if you can't get a blood sample then don't but you may not be able to take it abroad unless we get a, a brexit agreement which we're almost certain to i'm, I'm working on some some very very uh, exciting uh, uh, parts to the uh, the brexit deal and we'll, 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 we'll almost certainly have them uh, ironed out uh, uh, within the next uh, few uh, few few weeks uh, but the short answer is uh, go, go 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 and go and see your vet uh, who will either give you a, a vaccination or, or, or not and, and then either give uh, your, your, your your pet a, a, a blood sample or, or, or not uh, depending on on on, on his or or, 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 or or indeed her fancy so it is it, 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 no no, uh, no 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 confusion about it at all uh, they, they may or may not need something thank you thank, thank you very much indeed Boris Johnson and, for clearing that, that up and and that uh, is um despite the fact that you feel as fit as a butcher's dog and you are bursting with antibodies. <laughs> as fit as a butcher's dog. I, mean, <laughs> you know, I, I treated uh, our, our local butcher, I treated his dog uh, recently. Poor, poor thing has pancreatitis. Um, so I hope Boris gets over his pancreatitis uh, because if he's fit as that butcher's dog, he's not well at all. Not a healthy one. No. Not a healthy, not a healthy dog. <laughs> So Wolfgang, I couldn't help but notice uh, to your to your rear uh, on the wall there on the top Behind of the him. you've got a you've got a sort of funny sort of spiky hat, and I I thought we've seen that hat somewhere before. Can you see it off to I, your? I've seen that hat somewhere before, and that is the Fikavas Asenian hat. This is given. From time to time, and nobody knows when this is going to happen, is given to a special Fikava member who has done a lot of outstanding work for colleagues in Europe. And this uh, this helmet always turns up in the um, what shall I say, sort of in the most unlikely disguises, <laughs> and then suddenly there's a presentation taking place, usually in front of in front of a lot of other colleagues at a veterinary conference or something like that. But whenever this helmet is handed out, it's usually part of a, of a, yeah, what shall I say, sort of unforgettable little show event. Mm -hmm. so, I, I can see you're, um, very, you're very proud of this, Wolfgang. 
Well, Sorry. no, no, I, I have I, not I, been given as as the uh, 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 senior vice president, the uh, safekeeper of this helmet. The helmet is only given out one evening and can stay with the helmet bearer for one night and then it goes back to Fikava. But because, of, because of COVID, you've had it for the last two years. This is what you're saying. It uh, was back in 2010, I think. This helmet suddenly turned up at a Fikava meeting in Athens and was given to Peter Sterchi, um, the Swiss Fikava director or representative. Mm -hmm. so, um, so. And as you can see, this helmet has considerable pulling powers. Uh, <laughs> it, it does, this, it does, doesn't it? I feel the need to say to people who, who are listening rather than watching the, the broadcast that um, uh, this, this amazing helmet that, that, that Wolfgang is, is talking about is, um, I mean, it, it has to be seen to be believed. It, it looks a bit like uh, a Stegosaurus meets... Um, Five central large rhinoceros horns emanating from it. And Wolfgang is using it to, to great uh, effect, uh, pulling, uh, one has to say, the most gorgeous girl on the dance floor. So, well, that, that, that gorgeous girl is a professor of the uh, University of Rostov on Don in Russia. There was a performance in St. Petersburg at um, one of the last, or yeah, pretty much the last uh, physical um, uh, Fikava Congress. Mm. I asked, did, did you dance with her? Yeah, I think so. Yes, yeah. And so the idea was that there was a little bit of a, there was a little bit of a Beauty and the Beast performance, and uh, the. The idea was that we were sort of dancing, we're supposed to dance a waltz. And I said, well, there's a little um, Fekava um, entertainment element. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I wrote and uh, contacted my the uh, president of the Russian Small Animal Veterinary Association. And I said, um, Sergei, I have a... <laughs> I have a problem. Uh, you need to help me. And he said, okay, Wolfgang, what, what can I do for you? I said, I need a colleague, a lady who can dance a waltz and who is, who is up for some serious fun. Mm -hmm. So, and he said, okay, I'm working on it. So, and then he, I got this email from Maya, a very nice um, a colleague, as I said, at the university in, in Rostov. And, she contacted me and said, uh, uh, you need somebody to dance the walls and absolutely no problem. So, and then, then we met in St. Petersburg and um, <laughs> it was, it was uh, uh, great. The only problem was that she had never danced the walls. <laughs> the idea was that this, this helmet has to suddenly appear at a banquet. One time it was, for example, in, in, in Bavaria, it was presented by seven monks who were then um, walking with this helmet sort of through a, a beer hall in Munich, in uh, Senech, in Slovakia. It, uh, it was presented by an Icelandic uh, veterinarian who was coming in with raw fish and uh, with all sorts of strange things, so a big bearded man, and he was bringing this helmet in. And then the next time in Copenhagen, it was uh, presented by yeah, something like some bodyguards and with uh, the music of um, Mission Impossible sort of in the background. So it's always very sort of colorful. So with this one, the idea was that, that, that Maya was sort of, the beam was on Maya, the whole room was dark, nobody knew what was going on, and there was a shroud over the over the floor, and she was walking spotlight on her, so beautiful sort of young woman, sort of she's walking through the, uh, the, the room and the spotlight, and then she comes toward this shroud, and then she pulls the shroud away, and then underneath is this creature, with his helmet 
and Edson sort of gets up to the helmet so that you have to. Excellent. Okay. There is this bizarre creature now coming up. And then first sort of she runs away. And then the music in the in the background has seemed to change. So that we, we took music from the Phantom of the Opera for that. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're from 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 more this sort of da da when the when the phantom the first time appears, everybody is shocked and and scared of it. And then the sound gets more, what shall I say, melodic, and you can dance a waltz to it. Mm -hmm. And so the idea was then, so we were then, so she was coming closer, and I sort of waved her to come closer, and then we started then to dance, and so that was quite nice, and and that was the intro to the presentation of the Athenian helmet. So it, it always needs to be an entertainment element. So, if, if I suppose really the take-home message for this is that if you're bored, as most people are, with the London Vet Show and the <laughs> SAVO, join Ficava, because here we have gimp suits and helmets and dances with pretty girls and lights. Well, light well and even, even <laughs> good news, good news, if you are a BSAVA member, you are automatically a Ficava member. I was going to say, go to the meetings. Yes. Yeah. Please, please go. And and if I could just add, no one could ever be bored of BSAVA Congress because it is the best Congress. Yeah, but other vet shows are available next, uh, next March. No, no, no other Congresses other than for Carver are available. Oh, yeah. But, but um, you've got wonderful mood lighting there, Wolfgang. And, and I have to say, that I, want to, I want to get back to your, your dancing later because you are a fantastic dancer. Uh, it has to be said. I, 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 it's a very kind thing. And this is something, by the way, this is something that I'm really, really, really missing at the moment. Yeah. Fekava is, no, oh, not so good, Fekava, and also not Brexit, but COVID really sucks when it comes to that. Because mm. the trivial thing, dancing, the poor two people sort of move in tune with each other just for, for a few minutes, but they suddenly sort of have this symbiosis when when they are dancing. This is it's not happening. Not happening since last March. Not happening. And I, this is something I really miss. My, my, my wife is a is a wonderful salsa dancer. She she's tried to teach me a few times, but I I, I really do have the proverbial two left feet. Uh, I do dad's dancing, which, which I I'm pretty good at, pretty proficient at, and I usually have a a bit of a boogie at Congress. Uh, but I have to say, a few years back, I saw you uh, doing the light fantastic on, on the dance floor, and and you, you blew me away. You are absolutely fantastic. Uh, I, I think I think you should go on to Strictly. To be honest, <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> with with that hat, with that hat, yeah. they, have, they haven't had any vets on Strictly, have they? They haven't yet. No, they've had footballers, they've had chefs, they've had comedians. No vets. <laughs> So if anyone if anyone is watching from Strictly, please, this is this is the guy this to have on. This is the man. Wolfgang, and you you can contact him either directly or through Veterinary <laughs> Ramblings. We'll put you in touch. No problem. Okay. Wolfgang, you, you sort of you you your um your lighting has changed. You, you're almost sort of under a spotlight now. So I wonder whether we could put you under a spotlight a bit more, and give you a challenge, give you a challenge of sixty seconds CPD. Are you up for that? Exactly, exactly sixty seconds. Yeah, exactly sixty seconds. Yeah. So, so Wolfgang, you're going to do sixty seconds CPD for us, are you? And, uh, and what have you? Easy seconds. Just start when you. When you sixty want. seconds on challenging surgical skills of our listeners. Starting. Starting. Now. So. You think you're a good soft tissue surgeon and you want to do something new. You want to try something different. What you need is this here. If you haven't seen this device before, then I explain what this is. This is a special suturing device to staple small intestine 
So what you do is rather than if you have an enterectomy, rather than doing it all hand by hand, stitch by stitch, what you do is you just use this device here. You put one piece of gut in here, one piece of gut in here, close the clamp, then just slide the blade up and then open it again and it is stapled. So the stapling of the small intestine. Oh, oh is oh, it? Oh, 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 I don't know why. There we go. Stapling the small oh, oh. intestine. And that... <laughs> Very good. That was, that was I, that still, had, I still had four seconds. Oh, you did. Go on. Say, say, say anyway. four seconds more. Four seconds more. Go on. Go on. We'll give you an. Oh, oh, you're, you're, on, you're on one it's... minute, 20 seconds already. One minute, 20 seconds. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, no. One, one minute is too short. No, no, one it's minute. not. It's not. <laughs> Yeah, great. I'll, I'll, I'll let you into a secret. I'll let you into a secret, shall I? Yeah. Come on, you have it. Julian has it. Everybody knows about it. Huh? So I, I use it. I use it. But thirty-five years ago, yeah, I was the man that introduced that to the UK human field. Wow! Wow! There we go. There we go. Thirty-five years ago. Sorry. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. I had, I had this one one case we I had to do an enterotomy and uh, yeah. sorry an enterectomy in uh, in Sweden and uh, but some of our listeners aren't uh, on that so the, the, a difference between an enterotomy and an enterectomy so entero means gut or, or in this case small intestine so an enterotomy means to make a hole or an incision into a bit of gut usually to remove something an enterectomy means to remove a section of gut which you then of course have to have to close up and join uh, both ends it's a procedure where you then are left with two pieces of gut and they have to be connected again and that takes a while sort of because you have to specially suture it on one side then on the other side and you have to make sure that it is pretty tight after when you finish your suture with the you tend usually to do is that you inject it with saline to double check that there is no leak. Not so good if gut inter intestinal content is, uh, uh, yeah, then spilling mm. into the abdominal cavity. This this procedure, an enterectomy, that takes a considerable amount of time. Also, if you don't suture at speed, you will find that the ends of the intestine start swelling up which makes the whole job also more difficult because then it curls sort of outwards, but you want to see that the gut is turning inwards. So it's, it's, it's not easy. And this ingenious uh, device uh, uh, introduced to the UK by Mike Brampton 35 years ago, as we had to <laughs> learn. So that Pretty makes old. it much, much easier. Somebody who knows how to work with this can do an enterectomy rather than in 45 minutes in two minutes flat, if not even less. It, it's so it's so incredibly and quick. It really, yeah. really is. Mm -hmm. And I, I often wonder uh, why it hasn't caught on. And, and the I think cost the, cost. It's the price. What one of these here, three hundred pounds, and you have to throw it away after a single use. Mm -hmm. So yeah. once you've used it on one patient, you can't put it in the sterilizer. You can't reuse it again. So I didn't steal it. It would have been thrown away anyway. But I thought this yeah. is just amazing. But, but you're right. Yeah. They're, they're expensive. But but the yeah. plus side, they save so much time, and it's time uh, that's critical under an anaesthetic. The longer the time, the the the, uh, the, the more potential problems there are with infection, with uh, supply of blood and oxygen to tissues, etc. Uh, additionally, uh, because that gives a two or sometimes three layer closure, so a staggered uh, set of it's uh, staggered, yeah. yeah. Uh, the um, the amount of, of leakage or the likelihood of gut leakage is much lower than in hand suturing. So it's it's a safer and quicker technique. Uh, now, you would tend to charge for surgical time as a vet. Uh, and if you're doing, I, I, I tend to suture fairly quickly, 
So I, I, I would suture an anastomosis within about eight, eight to, to 10 minutes. Um, but even so, I can do a stapling within about 30 to 40 seconds. So there is a huge time saving. Uh, a, a new graduate, for example, may, may take uh, a couple of hours to do an anastomosis. Uh, but with staples, the first time out of the box, as it were, would, would take uh, somewhere between five and 10 minutes. So either way, it's a huge saving. And I think that really uh, counterbalances now the, the cost. So I'm, I'm hoping that the companies will will take uh, the initiative to, 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 to push these again, because they really are an incredibly useful uh, technique. Until you're, the you're absolutely right there. I mean, obviously, the quicker you can cut and close a wound, the, the better it is for healing. No, there's no question about that. And I think as we move forwards with pricing structures, um, mm -hmm. we're beginning to charge for the skills. You're, you're not charging for the 15 seconds it took. You're actually charging for the 50 years it took you to learn to do it in 15 seconds. And it, mm. it's, it's mm. learning the value of, of what it is that's, that's going on. But with a, with a device like that, there's no question. You're reducing anesthetic time. You're reducing um, post-operative complications. So you're getting quicker, neater, better surgery, and um, so much more if you, can, mm. if you can build that in. Now, for example, in Sweden, I would imagine that the insurance um, aspect and the fact that so many patients are insured has got a quite a, a, a big play on, on that particular um, aspect of things in that uh, the insurance companies will pay for a quicker, better outcome. And the clients mm. are insured. So mm. potentially, it's, it, a lot, I think, would probably come down to, in the UK to appropriate pricing structures and charging for the skills that are being exhibited, as well as potentially the, the outcomes using, let, let's say modern technology, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry to, to, to rain on your parade there, Wolfgang, you, you weren't to know that uh, that I was involved in that. No, 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 no. Long it's, ago. It's, um, it's very... I've, I've had a very mixed career, a little bit like yours, I think, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> you know, it's, um, it, it, there's no question, there's, there's a ready transfer, or there should be a ready transfer of human technology like that into the veterinary mm -hmm. field. Yeah. And it is the standard of surgical care in the human field. There's no question. Absolutely. A friend of mine who's who's a, 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 a colon surgeon, human colon surgeon, yep. uh, who was absolutely flabbergasted to hear that we don't routinely use them yep. for, uh, for, 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 for dog and cat surgery. Um, and I, I said, yeah, you know, we, we, we've, we've got a few and we use them if we're, if we're, if the case dictates. And you know, what what do you do otherwise? Yeah. As well, your, your hand suture. You you do what? Yeah. Well, it's it's a little bit like uh, it's a little bit like the introduction of the um, of the VJ in in the human field. Mm. <clears throat> the the laryngeal airway has has been around now for for decades, and one of the issues with that is that. A lot of the human medics are now losing the skills. They're becoming de-skilled in skills like standard intubation. Mm -hmm. And that now becomes a special training module to teach them the traditional skills of how to intubate a patient and protect their airway. Mm -hmm. And I can imagine that on the... I haven't been involved in, in general surgery now in the human side for, for at least 35 years, but I could imagine that if you suggested to a human um, gastroenterologist or, or, or GI surgeon or, or colon surgeon that he was going to have to hand suture an anastomosis, he would panic would ensue. And his senior registrar would probably ask you what on earth you were asking him to do. <laughs> Is there a vet in the house? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, th thanks for... Thanks for uh, Giving us that 60 second CPD, Wolfgang. Really well, it was a little bit more than 60 seconds. I failed badly. I failed we can badly. cut that. We can edit that out. It is for fun. It's for fun. Well, we, we but, don't... 
be, yeah. before I let you off the hook on that one, so if a quick question to uh, uh, back to you. On mental grafts, um, once you've done an anastomosis, do you tend to do an mental graft or not? What I, I, I used to, so so again, for, for, for listeners who may not be aware of, of this, uh, we're talking about reconstructing bits of gut. So we've done surgery, we've, we've re-fused uh, two bits of gut together. Join the tube up. Join the tube up, absolutely. Yeah. We, joined, we welded the tubes. Uh, and uh, one of the ways of, of improving results and trying to reduce the effects of, of minor leakage uh, used to be to, to put some of the omentum, the the, uh, the, the loose uh, tissue of, of the helpful. It's a helpful membrane which is Abs in the abdomen. Absolutely, the abdominal bandage is sometimes called. Uh, so, so these flaps of, of uh, seemingly otherwise useless tissue uh, in the guts—they're not useless; they're, they're incredibly useful. Well, um, so a quick time out here. Wasn't yes. wasn't the omentum classified as an organ in its own right fairly recently? It, it is. It is absolutely. We, we, we're only just for, for, for decades or centuries. We've we've just used we've just labelled this stuff as stuff. It, it was stuff. It, it's, it's a sort of cling film that that, that helps yeah. suspend the gut in in uh, in its normal state. But no, it has a huge uh, role to play in in uh, in the defence. Well, he's going shaking his head, Julian. <laughs> huge role to play in in in. Um, antimicrobial defense uh, in, in, in the gut. But the idea was that the, you would then take a bit of momentum and suture it in place over an anastomotic site. Um, I, I used to do that. I, what I do, I still get a bit of momentum and wrap it round. I don't tend to suture it. Uh, it tends suture. to adhere. Okay. Mm -hmm. what, what's, um, what's the latest thinking then, Wolfgang? Share, share it with us. Well, no, 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 I'm just interested because, I mean, when I do, um, when I do gut surgery, I usually cover the area and but but secure also with a couple of sutures the omentum over the defect because it um, it helps uh, protect the. I mean, it will not stop proper leakage, but you also see if if you have a penetration, a hole in the gut, and then you open that up, you will pretty much always find. That this magical membrane, which is in the intest, uh, which is in the abdomen, has somehow found its way to the area where this infection is, and it doesn't have a muscle or something like that to do it. It is just migrating in that area and then sealing this defect. Uh, it's it's absolutely incredible. So if this is the gut here, and there's a there's a hole in here, then this stuff sort of if you comes in and lays itself sort of over this area. And there are cases where a uh, minor perforation of the gut was in fact sort of completely saved and healed by the omentum. It's a, it's a magical yeah. membrane. It's, it's, it's very it's, magical. Right? I don't yeah, tend yeah. to place anymore. I tend to just wrap it around. But, but I have used the omentum uh, in places other than the gut. And... Um, uh, a couple of years back now, I had a, a case um, that, that a colleague referred to me that that was a uh, really quite a nasty open fracture of the uh, of the tibia, so the lower bone, the shin bone of, of a dog, and uh, unfortunately it had become infected, and this poor dog had the bone exposed over about an eight inch long and, and three inch wide area, uh, and so. They were putting dressings on, trying to trying to get it to to heal. It had lost the the the, the periosteal covering, so the, the little membrane surrounding the bone, uh, and it was never going to heal. So unless bone is is um, uh, sorry, unless uh, oh, from the outside, yes, the, the, the skin is able to cover the bone and skin overlying it won't won't heal. Uh, so what I did was to treat it for a few days by regular flushing, debriding, so getting rid of infected tissue. Uh, I didn't use antibiotics on it, but I just got it to the stage that, um, that it would clear the infection and get uh, 
a bit of fresh tissue growing in from the sides of the wounds. I then opened the abdomen up, got a bit of momentum and did a momentum lengthening procedure. So I, I made various cuts in it, which enabled me to pass the momentum down through the inner thigh. And I wrapped it round the tibial bone. And I then used that as a source of blood supply to the bone and the underlying tissues. And I was able then to, to elevate a, a skin flap uh, called the called the superficial epigastric flap, uh, which follows the line of, of mammary tissues along the uh, the abdomen. I, I used that flap to turn around to cover the the the, the, the wound on the tibia. So I, I was able to use the omentum there as a sort of internal dressing to to provide uh, a blood supply and a uh, a stable skin graft bed, if you like. To, to, to suit you to. I, I have I have to say there, Julian, as you as you were telling me that story, I was beginning to think, oh, it, it's joke time, and he started on his latest joke. But actually, that was quite that was rather interesting. It's, it's Next. About, you never do. I, I have a I have a joke. Uh, Mike mentioned yeah. the ones that people like, but but about this sort of time, we we we, we sort of um, try try and very very slowly ramble our way to to a close, and I I usually tell a completely crap joke, and tonight's no different. And I, I thought I thought I'd tell the joke the about, about the golfer. Um, and I normally try and get a joke that that, that fits in with, with 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 the subject, but uh, for the life of me, I couldn't find one that was in any way decent. So I thought I'd, I'd tell this joke about the golfer, who um, is a retired pro, and and whenever people have lost their golfing partner or, or their, their golfing partner goes off ill, uh, they, they they phone this guy and say, look. I want a game of golf tomorrow, any chance you can make it? And he'll usually say yes. So th th this uh, conversation normally goes a bit like, uh, John, I, any chance you could meet me at the golf course nine o'clock tomorrow morning? Is yeah, I'll be, I'll be there nine o'clock. I, I might be a bit late. I might be a bit late, but I'll get there as close to nine as possible. And so, you know, the next day comes and this guy's there nine o'clock on the dot and he plays his game and, uh, uh, they will have fun, and then you know another another day goes by. And uh, John, um, any chance of, uh, of playing uh, game tomorrow about nine o'clock? Yeah, no problem at all. I might be late, but nope. The next day turns up at nine o'clock, and and this sort of thing goes on. Occasionally, occasionally he's late. Ten, I've passed, but usually it's yep yeah, nine o'clock. I might be late. I might be late, but I'll try and make it for nine. And if he's, if he's there, he's there at nine on the dot, or he's really late. And a friend of him says to him, what, what is this all about? I mean, you, you play a really good game of golf, which is why we, we ask you along. But you do this, this whole thing of, I might be late. And you're either exactly on time, or, or you turn up an hour, hour and a half late. What, what are you playing at? He said, well, um, I wake up uh, about half past eight in the morning, and I look at my wife. And uh, sometimes she's lying on her right side. Well, I'm in normal time then. I'm on time. Sometimes she's lying on her, on her left side. I'm in normal time. Sometimes she's lying on her back. We're about half an hour late after that, hey! <laughs> so that's talking, what, about, bad. talking about crap joke. <laughs> oh, man, Julian. <laughs> It's pretty good, isn't it? But, but 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 we can we can gloss over that. We can gloss over the bad joke because I've got I've got a joke. What? <laughs> I've got a joke. I'm, I'm going to tell a joke. I'm going to tell an appropriate joke about colon health because some people say about that, colon health. Yeah, because I some think people that is because already, some, you killed it already. I think because <laughs> well, some people say that leafy greens are the best thing for colon health. But I think fibre makes a solid number two. <laughs> That's pretty good. That's a very okay. So as you both understand the as, difference as, between as, the number as you one. Both told a joke. Now yep. I'm telling you. Go on then. Go on then. Go on then. Hang on. Uh, hang on. This is going to be remarkable. Yep. Yeah. A German <laughs> telling a joke. 
Yes. Thank you, Wolfgang. Thank you. There we go. There we go. Let's see. Three American presidents standing in on the Pearl Gate and uh, standing in front of uh, uh, God. And uh, so the first one is George W. Bush. And uh, he said, well, I uh, try to lead the country and I uh, try to be a great president. And OK, here, there, I failed. But altogether, I think I didn't do too bad a job. So. God said, okay, fine, uh, you sit on my left side. And comes Barack Obama. He said, well, I'm the first uh, black president of the United States, and I invented Obamacare to help a lot of people. Um, so I think I, I deserve to be here as well. So then he said, okay, yeah, makes sense. So you can sit on my right side. Hmm? Then comes Donald Trump, and he doesn't say anything. So, um, and then God says, um, Donald, and uh, don't you want to say why you're here? And he said, um, I'm just wondering why you are sitting on my chair. <laughs> nah. so I think that it is in equal way <laughs> told so badly. So, but anyway, so for, for a German, it wasn't too bad. <laughs> no, I, I, think, I think it's very good, and I think I think what it shows is that we do better CPD than jokes. Yeah, yeah, yeah true. True. And to that, and to that end, uh, I, I think we've deserved a CPD certificate for tonight. And so he, here we go. Here's a CPD oh. certificate. So what have we got tonight? Oh, okay. What we've got tonight that says certificate because we care. <laughs> we do. We care. So this shows everyone, including you. Mm -hmm. That we deliver top class ramblings of a veterinary nature and no one else does. And so there we go. That's that's, that's our brand's veterinary ramblings. That is uh, me and him. And look, there you see, that's me doing some ski mountaineering. But can you spot the obvious mistake? Yeah, there's no skis in it. Absolutely forgot them that day. Yeah, I had to back back. Day. Didn't see that. I only I was a little bit confused by the helicopter, which is fast approaching to rescue. The, the helicopter is fast approaching, absolutely. And there's a bit of gut there yep. that, that's been removed using um, uh, using staples. You can just see I think the line of staples e either side there is nice, uh, clean cut and seal. I will certainly frame that one and hang it up above my bed. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's a flamingo. Yeah. Why? That's perfectly logical. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Good. There we go. Okay. So um, <laughs> now, I, I have no idea why the flamingos are. Just I, I like flamingos. It was a nice picture. Wrong with that? So we need having having had this this CBD, we, we need to fulfil the requirements of the RCVS. We need to reflect. Would you join us in reflection? Would you join us, please, Wolfgang? And, okay. and reflect on on the CPD that we have given to the master. Do we have to hold? Do we have to hold hands when we do that? Or we can do that. But being that it's a Zoom meeting, we have to hold our own hands. But, yeah. Um, yeah. But we do have to reflect. Please join us, Walter. You're speaking, Julian. I I, I did a bit here. Yeah. What? What are you doing, Wolf? Sorry, what? sorry, I'm so sorry. What? I must have slipped here. Oh, I here. cannot sorry, believe I... it. Okay, look. He, maybe maybe I got more. On that no, note, no, on that it's note, the car, on that it's note it's Wolfgang was playing with his mobile phone during reflection of CPD, I think we'd better call this a night. That's great. I'm Wolf so sorry I messed it up. I big fail, so okay. I will not record it on my CPD account for this. Yeah, year. best not to. Yeah, best, best not, not to. Wolfgang, thank you so much. Wolfgang, you. But I still want to have the certificate. You can Damn, have the certificate. You can yeah. have the certificate. It's available for download and talking about download. If you've enjoyed what we've given you this evening, don't forget to subscribe, click like, share it with some friends who you think might also enjoy our show. <laughs> Wolfgang, Wolfgang thank, you thank you so much for joining us this evening. It's been a fabulous evening. And just raise a glass and may your yeah. dog 
may your dog go with you. Oh no, I still have something in it. Still. Oh, yeah. May your dog go with you. Okay. Cheers. Cheers. And cut. Cut. That's very good. All good stuff. All so, good stuff. So yeah. listen, so thank you very much for giving up your evening. Thank you. Thanks a million. And we'll speak no, soon. I mean, <laughs> what would have been the alternative? So oh, yeah. it, it's, 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 the owner of Bruce and politics yeah. and all of that. Listen, it's, you've had all that exactly. here. Exactly. You've had all that here. So you've and more. Made your and more. So and much more. There we go. And, and the real Boris Johnson. Yes. Yeah. 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 There you go. Excellent. <laughs>